we're going to start today with perhaps my favorite quote from my favorite video of all time. I'm a bit of a lefty myself. Um, I'm a bit of a leftist when it comes to some economics, but I'm going to say ScoMo's almost swayed my vote and he's about to do it the next election because I reckon a bloke that can win the unwinnable election it speaks volumes of his character. For context, this was the young liberals interviewing people at schoolies and when that guy says he might sway me, well, he himself was a young liberal and knew the interviewers. The video became a total meme and ended at least three political careers. People also took the hate way too far. But it was an accurate representation of what a lot of people in Australia thought. As we look at the beginning of the ScoMo years, it's easy to let the last few years colour our perception. That he secured the Liberals a third term was nothing short of a political miracle, and given he entered office on a poison chalice, he ended up being pretty damn popular at the end of his first year. So, what happened? He could be here for a long, long time. The thought of that enables many Australians to breathe a sigh of relief. So if you're thinking that this channel has taken a wild turn in terms of its political coverage, it certainly hasn't. These days, Morrison has very few defenders, but back in 2019, it really looked like he was the first Liberal leader to completely unite the party behind him since John Howard. So we left the Turnbull episode with ScoMo being the secret puppet master and having his faction back Dutton, while well, he himself publicly backed Turnbull. The commonly used meme was the one where Scott Morrison was Steve Bradbury and accidentally stumbled over into the top job. But this was no accident, and Morrison was quick to secure his position. So when Rudd returned as Prime Minister back in 2013, he instituted new party rules to prevent any future coups. Rather than needing just a simple majority for a spill motion, he instead required a three-quarter majority. Morrison adopted these same rules, but instead required a two-third majority to knife a leader. By these rules, Turnbull would have actually stayed in. But it was only a temporary measure. Having a stable position within the party was no use if that party went down just eight months later. And it's hard to overstate just how unlikely an electoral victory looked in 2019. Just after Morrison came into office, Labor was up 55 to 45 in the two party preferred polls. So obviously with the fall of Turnbull came a new leadership team. Now Morrison was Turnbull's treasurer, so that position became vacant, and Morrison decided it was the right time to give a big job to a rising player within the party, Josh Frydenberg. Together, they passed a vital budget. Now before you click off because I said the word budget, let me just say this. This is where the magic of the unwinnable election truly happened. So the budget is typically passed at the end of the financial year to allocate spending for the next financial year. Given that the election was in May of 2019, the Liberals passed a budget in April with the proviso that this was what they were going to do if elected for the next financial year. Now, if you're up to date with the series, you'd remember that Howard and Costello effectively created a perception that the success of the economy relied on whether or not the budget was in surplus or in deficit. As I said before, I think this is an irrelevant metric. What's much more important is a structural surplus, i.e. if left alone, does the budget result in future revenue way down the track? Given that Howard was in power during the early commodities boom, mining meant that he could deliver consistent surpluses without needing to spend. But when Rudd came in, Australia encountered the GFC and needed to spend on stimulus packages to prevent the economy from coming to a grinding halt, meaning the budget went back into deficit. Since then, Gillard and Abbott's government both promised surpluses but failed to deliver them. Under Turnbull, the Liberals again never delivered a surplus. All this to say that this provided the context for Frydenberg and Morrison to pass one of the greatest acts of deception. Firstly, Frydenberg announced that the budget was back in black and the Liberals had delivered a surplus. But the surplus was for the next financial year, not for 2019. 2019 was projected as a deficit year of $4 billion. Back in 2016, Morrison had criticised Labor for making future projections, using the Cronulla Sharks as an example. I can say this year, I'm very confident about how the Cronulla Sutherland Sharks are going to go in, in this year's Premiership. Uh, I couldn't tell you how they're going to go five years from now, and I certainly couldn't tell you how they're going to go ten years from now. And Chris Bowen and Bill Shorten and uh, Tony Burke are out there making these sorts of forecasts out into the never-never. Now, in fairness to Morrison, the Sharks actually won the comp that year, up up, but he certainly didn't heed his own advice as the budget assumed that unemployment would remain at historic low of 5%. When it got to 2020, the Liberals never delivered that surplus, instead delivering a $213 billion deficit for obvious reasons. If only 2019 Morrison listened to 2016 Morrison. 
but that didn't matter. Morrison could go around boasting of being the Prime Minister who brought the budget back into surplus for the first time since before the GFC. Secondly, Morrison's budget forecasted a whole heap of income tax for the 2020-2021 financial year. The net cost of these tax cuts would be $158 billion and this was targeted towards the middle class. Essentially, all those who annually earn $90,000 to $120,000 would be collapsed into what used to be the $37,000 to $90,000 tax bracket. Finally, Morrison wasn't an idiot and knew that it was not impossible to turn those polls around in such little time. That being said, Labor's advantage was in the popular vote rather than the swing seats, and so he had every reason to think that the Liberals might only be on track for a narrow loss. If Frydenberg could booby trap the budget with things that would be unpopular to repeal, the Libs could potentially return in 2022. Citing the threat of China, the Liberals vowed to increase defence spending from 1.89% of GDP to 2.04% of GDP by 2022. Having stoked much fear over China, for Labor to back off from that promise would open them up to the criticism of being weak on defence. But having spoken so much of China's military build-up in the Pacific, this would mean that it would spend half a percentage point more on defence than China was. Now, before you all go calling me a dove, I do admit that I'm in the minority in thinking that this huge defence increase isn't a good use of taxpayer money. However, I'm sure I'm in the majority by saying that Morrison spending $80 billion in defence contracts for the next decade at the last hour of an election was a blatant attempt to bury Labor in debt. So I think it's fair to say that the 2019 budget was not actually at all about the 1920 financial year. So this brings me to the 2019 election, and on the surface it was as classic a Liberal vs Labor election as it comes. Labor tried to excite, the Liberals tried to scare. And so Morrison decided not to break with orthodoxy and appealed to credentials of the Liberals being perceived as good economic managers while claiming that Labor would cripple the nation with unnecessary taxes and reckless spending. Now, in 2019, there were two major issues when it came to tax. The first of these were franking credits. We first looked at them back in the Hawk episode. Beforehand, the dividends of shareholders were firstly being taxed the corporate tax, and then after receiving their dividend, they were taxed the income tax. In an effort to prevent double tax, Keating introduced a system called franking credits where people could get a credit to reclaim the amount lost in income tax. This was done in people's tax returns. However, in 2000, Howard and Costello expanded the system to allow those who don't pay income tax to also get a credit. Effectively, this allowed retirees to claim money off the government for simply holding shares. Shorten campaigned on removing this scheme and going back to Keating's model of just having the credit supply for those who were paying income tax. He said that this would free up approximately $6 billion in the budget each year by closing a tax loophole. However, Morrison pounced on Shorten's promise and reframed it as him placing a tax on retirees that would cripple their retirement fund. And this was done to devastating effect. Retirees flocked to the Liberals in huge numbers while most who'd benefit from those extra $6 billion in the budget didn't care for what franking credits were. And when it came to tax, the second huge issue was to do with negative gearing. So a negatively geared property is one that generates less revenue than it costs in expenses. Now, all the way back in 1922, Stanley Bruce introduced laws that allowed people to claim the losses of a negatively geared property off of their income tax at the end of the year. The Hawke-Keating government abolished it, and Keating even called it a rort, saying that investment should be encouraged in businesses that generate actual value, rather than a property that just stands still. But by doing so, he annoyed investment property holders and expended a lot of political capital and walked it back two years later. Having first proposed it back in 2016, Shorten campaigned on removing negative gearing once again. For context, housing prices had gone through the roof in the 2010s and taking away the lure of negative gearing would disincentivize investment property owners, which would then reduce the demand, which would then ease the prices. Of course, falling housing prices is bad news for everyone who owns a property, and with some just taking out massive mortgages, they weren't keen to have their biggest asset depreciate in value. Again, Morrison hit Shorten on playing into the politics of envy and wanting to stop hardworking and aspirational people from owning investment properties. Take this as an example. Labor's housing tax will hurt all of you. So credit to Morrison, his campaign was clear and effective, if not a little manipulative, and as May of 2019 loomed, Liberal was closing in on Labor in the polls. Some, like Alan Jones, even said that though the Libs were on track to lose the popular vote, they'd do enough to keep key swing states and hold government. But on top of that, Morrison got a slight helping hand too. The media. Right here is a list of the endorsements from all the major papers in Australia. For the most part, especially all the Murdoch papers, they went for Liberal. The Murdoch bit is especially important because some of the key swing states were in Queensland where he has a near monopoly on the news. Even the biggest scout for Labor, the Sydney Morning Herald, were only tentatively supportive of Shorten. Oh, and there was also another key factor behind the 2019 election. Sports rods. 
Starting from February, Morrison's government gave grants to sporting clubs in need. The issue was that 70% of the proposed clubs receiving funding weren't clubs listed by the Australian National Audit Office who wrote up on the report on sports funding. Instead, these were predominantly given to clubs in coalition seats such as Lillipilly FC in Morrison's Cook. I'm a stingray. We hate Lillipilly. On top of that, Morrison's Minister for Regional Services, Bridget McKenzie, gave a grant to a rugby club for a women's change room, despite not having a women's team. So as Australia went to the polls, Shorten was certainly the favourite, but not by the margin he enjoyed just a year earlier. As the night unfolded and as Queensland went for the Libs, it was clear that Morrison was going to hold on to government. This then led to the greatest victory speech. I have always believed in miracles. <laughs> Alongside those celebrating Morrison's win was Donald Trump. Remember, Morrison had played the China card to justify a huge spike in military spending, which only further entrenched Australia as a staunch US ally. Having had two bites of the cherry, Shorten resigned as leader of the party and was replaced with the Albanese. Albo said Labor needed some soul searching and was keen to avoid the Democrats' mistake of having an outburst at the result. He'd remain remarkably disciplined. As Morrison now had to face the prospect of governing with this booby trap budget, he needed something remarkable. Something that could even justify abandoning the 2021 target. But turning his attention away from the economy, Morrison confirmed that the Liberal Party rejected the Uluru Statement and Morrison characterised the voice as a third chamber of parliament. Not only that, but Morrison had to deal with an unprecedented number of scandals within his own cabinet. For instance, a story broke that back in 2017, the water minister, Barnaby Joyce, bought $80 million worth of water off of a Cayman Island company that used to be owned by other coalition MP, Angus Taylor. The estimated value of this water was anywhere from $40 million to $0. Secondly, back in 2017, the coalition gave Warren Mundine a $220,000 grant to host a show on Sky News called Mundine Means Business. The show then ran for a second season from 2018 to 2019, and the government funded 15% of the cost. At the same time as Mundine was giving his show, Morrison urged the New South Wales State Executive of the Liberal Party to pre-select Mundine for the seat of Gilmore in the Shoalhaven. Effectively, this was blatant state-sponsored propaganda. Finally, the Lord Mayor of Sydney, Clover Moore, wrote to the Minister for Energy, Angus Taylor, asking him to declare a climate emergency. Taylor responded by leaking a document to the Daily Telegraph that revealed Moore to be a hypocrite as the City of Sydney Council spent $15.9 million on transport in the 2017-18 financial year. Except, there was just one problem with this. Moore herself provided documentation that proved it actually spent only $6,000 on transport. Taylor said he got the government from the council's website, but no archive version of the website showed this document. It appeared that Taylor presented a forged document. Labor referred this matter to the New South Wales Police, and they began an investigation, and Morrison refused to stand Taylor down during the investigation. Interestingly, the commissioner, Mick Fuller, was Scott Morrison's neighbour, and Morrison called him to discuss the case. Neither have released any details regarding the call, apart from Fuller maintaining that Morrison didn't ask any inappropriate questions. The matter was eventually given to the AFP and they stopped the investigation. Now, when it came to foreign policy, most of the key moves were made in the 2020s and we'll cover them next week, but there were a few really key decisions in Morrison's early days. He followed Trump's lead in promising to move Australia's embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, effectively a pro-Israel statement considering both Israel and Palestine view Jerusalem as their capital. In the Pacific, Morrison launched the Pacific Step Up Plan, which was basically an attempt to combat the influence of China in Oceania. A $2 billion infrastructure bank was set up as well as a training program for Pacific militaries. Unfortunately for Morrison, many Pacific leaders simply just didn't take him seriously as he had earlier laughed at Peter Dutton's joke about Pacific nations being flooded by rising seas. <laughs> and the Liberals had boasted about knocking down climate change initiatives like the Emissions Trading Scheme, Carbon Tax and even Turnbull's National Energy Guarantee. Fiji's Prime Minister even called Morrison insulting and condescending. Given how dependent Fiji is on Australia, that'd be like our Prime Minister calling the US President insulting and condescending. Apart from that, Morrison signed a free trade deal with Indonesia and was extremely critical of China's harsh suppression of Hong Kong protests. Now, as I've alluded to multiple times, Morrison would only double down on his anti-China stance. Whether you think that this was born out of self or national interest is probably something this video won't change. However, I think it's worth pointing out just how unhelpful some people within the party machinery were. So South Australian Liberal Christopher Pine resigned before the 2019 election. He then became a lobbyist and even ended up as the chairman of the Australian Missile Corporation. Now, why would they want Pine as a lobbyist? Well, it's of course because he has great connections within the Liberal Party and still has influence there. 
and what's in the interest of arms manufacturers. It's to promote as much fear about another country as possible to justify an arms increase, which would then give them massive contracts. So unfortunately, there were so many vested interests in having a negative relationship with China. But by the end of 2019, foreign policy was only a peripheral issue, and Morrison would face perhaps Australia's biggest ever crisis, and the crisis he'd become infamous for. This of course was the bushfires. So starting as far back as the end of winter, fire broke out in northern New South Wales, and it was rapidly spreading south. Now, just to be clear, this was a very predictable fire season. Australia was on the back of an intense drought and it was now Nino summer. Unfortunately, the federal government was caught wildly unprepared. So the National Aerial Firefighting Centre is responsible for organising Australia's fleet of firefighting aircraft. They're actually a private rather than government organisation. Previously, 50% of their funding was provided by the government, but under Morrison it had just dropped to 23%. Now, on top of this, Bill Shorten had actually made firefighting a key part of his campaign, promising an $80 million fleet of bush firefighting aircraft and the introduction of new smoke jumper units. How boss is this? Smoke jumpers belay from helicopters with chainsaws to contain a fire. These were promised as early as March, and as Greater Sydney came under pressure by November, it really wasn't a good look for Morrison, who had earlier called Labor reckless spenders. But as we all know, this wouldn't even be the worst bit for Morrison. In December, Morrison went on that fateful holiday to Hawaii. His office declined to give info on his whereabouts or the length of his vacation due to security reasons, and even said he wasn't in Hawaii. Of course, when it became clear that he was there while the country was burning, public pressure called him to return. Upon returning, Morrison apologised for any offence caused, and when asked why he left during the crisis, Morrison said, you know, I don't hold a hose, mate, and I don't sit in yeah. the control room. Morrison also claimed he informed Albanese of his holiday. Albo denied this, and the text records couldn't verify Morrison's claims. When Morrison finally went to comfort bushfire victims and I guess offer support, the reaction he got was one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever witnessed. At the time, Friendly Geordie's most popular ever video was one that had absolutely no jokes and called for the Crown to fire Morrison while also praising another Liberal, Tony Abbott, for his volunteer service in fighting the fires. Having missed the boat for an $80 million fleet, Morrison gave an emergency $11 million infusion into a short-term fleet. Because there was no time to build planes, Morrison needed to purchase American and Canadian planes, which meant $2.2 million was lost in bad exchange rates. 243,000 square kilometres were burnt down, nearly 10,000 buildings destroyed, 71% of koala habitat gone, 8,000 koalas dead, and then 34 people killed directly by the fires and 445 indirectly by smoke inhalation. Quite literally, it was the darkest summer Australia had ever faced, and for Morrison, he'd gone from the champion of quiet Australia to the man who completely mishandled our darkest hour. As the dreaded 2020-2021 budget was approaching, Morrison was in real danger of plummeting off of the polls. What Morrison really needed was a second crisis, one that would give him the chance to restore his reputation and one that would mean he could abandon the 2020-2021 budget entirely. And then of course, the news emerged. A new coronavirus had ravaged Wuhan and was rapidly spreading. We of course will finish off Morrison and indeed the series next week, but crucially, Morrison was far from the only one to blame for the bushfires. Did you know that right before the bushfires, New South Wales Fire and Rescue had its budget slashed by 35%. Check out this video on Gladys Berejiklian to see how the media created a cult of personality around her.